Nicknames are funny things. Uh, they're often derived from events that are almost forgotten that happened way back in the past. Given their importance and the nostalgia of their citizens that came from them, it's not a surprise that cities get nicknames as well as people. And while those nicknames are often well known, their origins are often not so well known and maybe wrapped up in legends that aren't necessarily representative of truth. The history of the nicknames of three of America's great cities provides sort of a survey of the history of the nation. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The United States Capitol was created under authority, granted under Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, and specifically by the Residence Act of 1790, created on land ceded by Maryland and Virginia. The U.S. Capitol was really rather unique. Instead of an established city, the new district would be carved out of the wilderness and swamp, specifically designed to operate as a national capital. The seat of government was moved to the new district in 1800. It was at the time a dirty, muddy backwater of a national capital, and it quickly earned nicknames. For example, Jose Carrera de Sura, Minister Plenipotentiary of Portugal from 1816 to 1820, memorably coined the term the City of Magnificent Distances. While this may sound like a compliment regarding the scale of a city carved based on a specific plan for a national capital, in fact, historians recognize that the name was actually a sarcastic expression of de Sura's famous wit. The Great Distances referred to a city that was little more than Great Distances. Early uses of the term did not so much use the term to refer to the grandeur of the capital of the nation, but to the fact that the distances between buildings was so far that one always needed a carriage and there was virtually nothing in between. When Charles Dickens visited in 1842, he remarked that the city was not so much a city of great distances, but a city of great intentions. While again, this sounds like a compliment regarding the aspirations of the young democracy, it was in fact intended as an insult. Dickens was referring both to a city that was more intention than reality, with spacious avenues that begin in nothing and lead nowhere, streets mile long that only want houses, roads, and inhabitants, public buildings that need but a public to be complete and ornaments of great thoroughfares, which only lack great thoroughfares to ornament. But Dickens was also referring to his disappointment with American politics, which he did not think lived up to the high ideals expressed in the monuments of the new capital. A more recent nickname for the nation's capital has also drawn attention. Washington, D.C. has frequently been called in political punditry, Hollywood for ugly people. A 2010 article in the Washington Post tried to track down the origin of the nickname and concluded its first use in print was in a 1992 Washington Post interview of political consultant and Clinton speechwriter Paul Begalia, who said it compared politics and acting. There's a needy quality that actors and politicians have, he explained, but there's also an element of caprice to any political career. Mr. Begalia gave no justification for the ugly people part, apparently assuming the meaning was obvious. However, Mr. Begalia did not claim credit for coining the nickname, saying, I might have heard it in a bar. The city we now call New York was first established as a Dutch fur trading settlement named New Amsterdam in 1624. In 1664, the colony was taken by the English as part of an effort by King Charles II's brother and future King James, Duke of York, then Lord High Admiral, to provoke a war with the Dutch Republic. The colony was surrendered without bloodshed and renamed New York. It would be another 245 years before New York would earn the nickname with which it is most associated today. And no, the nickname the Big Apple doesn't have anything to do with New York's apples, at least not in any way that you might think. There are many competing theories regarding the exact meaning and origin of the name, but in the 19th century, apples were highly valued, and the Big Apple was generally a term for the best. This might be derived from speculation that farmers packaged the largest apples at the top of a barrel to hide the less desirable ones underneath. Apple was also a term that people who lived in rural areas used to refer to cities. Thus, the Big Apple was an obvious term to apply to the nation's largest and most cosmopolitan city. That idea likely underlies the several ways people have theorized the nickname may have come to be associated with New York. The first use of the term in print was in a travel guide published in 1909. The book called The Wayfarer in New York essentially describes the city as being the finest fruit of the American tree, much to the frustration of the rest of the tree. New York is merely one of the fruits of that great tree whose roots go down in the Mississippi Valley and whose branches spread from one ocean to the other. But the tree has no great degree of affection for its fruit. It inclines to think that the Big Apple gets a disproportionate share of the national sap. 
It is disturbed by the enormous drawing power of a metropolis, which constantly attracts to itself wealth and its possessors from all the lesser centers of the land. Every city, every state pays an annual tribute of men and business to New York, and no state or city likes particularly to do it. That might have been the first reference where the term the Big Apple was used in print, but it seems to imply that the associations have been made long before, and if that's true, we don't really know when New York started to be called the Big Apple. One possible early story talks about a downtown New York brothel whose ladies of the evening referred to their madam as Big Apples. And while there's no apparent truth to a story that's probably apocryphal, it would be quite a colorful story if it was her apples that are the New York apples from which the nickname was derived. But regardless of when the term may have first been used to refer to New York, the nickname first started to become popularized because of horse racing. The horse race prizes in New York were the largest in the country, and stable hands elsewhere, some suggest starting in New Orleans, aspired to race in those races, calling them the Big Apples. This might have been due to the aforementioned general use of the term, or simply because horses like apples. In terms of betting, a Big Apple was also a common term for a sure thing. Sports writer John J. Fitzgerald wrote for the New York Morning Telegraph, and in the 1920s started regularly using the term to refer to New York when reporting on horse racing. In 1924, he wrote, The Big Apple, the dream of every lad that ever threw a leg over a thoroughbred, and the goal of all horsemen. There's only one Big Apple. That's New York. But the term was also linked to the 1930s New York City jazz scene, where gigs were referred to as apples, and gigs in New York, after playing in small towns, were called Big Apples. It was the jazz reference that inspired Charles Gillette, the head of the New York City Visitors Bureau, to run a 1970s tourism campaign, complete with stickers and pins. The campaign was used to help to transform the tarnished image of New York City, then known for crime, financial difficulties, and white flight. The campaign helped to transform the city's image, and the nickname, popularity, and usage has grown ever since. But there's another and older nickname for New York City whose origin is also interesting. New York City is often called Gotham. Many people seem to assume that that's because of the name of the city that is the home of the comic book superhero, Batman. In fact, calling New York Gotham dates back to the famous author Washington Irving, who helped author a satirical periodical called Selma Gundy, published in 1807 and 1808. In the November 11, 1807 edition of the magazine, Irving wrote a piece called The Chronicles of the Renowned and Ancient City of Gotham, in which the thrice-renowned and delectable city was invaded by hopping tots who, egregiously addicted to migrations, overrun Gotham with dance. The story is a reference to a 15th century English story about villagers in a town called Gotham, which means roughly goat pen, who pretend to be crazy in order to chase away King John and avoid taxes. Thus, Irving was satirically likening New Yorkers to a village of people who deliberately choose to act crazy. New Yorkers, being New Yorkers, embrace the term. In December 1940, Gotham City was identified as the home of Batman in issue number four. Batman creator Bill Finger explained that Batman's original home was to be New York City, but that he and Batman co-creator Bob Kane wanted to make it a fictional city to allow anyone in the city to identify with it. They tried many names, including Civic City and Coast City, but in the end got the name Gotham from a New York City phone book when they spotted a business called Gotham Jewelers. Thus, the name of Batman City was named after a nickname for New York City, which was used by a New York City jeweler and derived from a story by Washington Irving, which was itself derived from a 15th century English story about a town full of people who deliberately act crazy and that was named after a pen for goats. Chicago was formed in 1828 when the Illinois legislature appointed commissioners to locate a canal and lay out a town near the mouth of the Chicago River. The name Chicago derives from a French rendering of a Native American term for a type of wild leek found in abundance near the mouth of the river. So Chicago means, roughly, wild onions. A plat or plan of the town was filed in 1830 and is considered the first recognition of a place called Chicago. The town was incorporated in 1833. Population, 350. A center where produce from Midwest farmlands could be taken east on the Great Lakes, aided in 1848 by the Illinois and Michigan Canal, which allowed a connection between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River, Chicago grew quickly. In the 40 years, from 1850 to 1890, the city's population grew from slightly under 30,000 to over a million. The city's most popular nickname is the Windy City, a nickname that was well established in the 19th century, but the etymology of the name is an interesting matter of dispute. 
Common sense would say that the name comes from the winds that blow through the city from Lake Michigan. Some early stories suggest that the city's early skyscrapers funneled the wind so that you might be compelled to grab your hat even on an otherwise calm day. Chicago also billed itself as a resort city, claiming that the winds off the lake kept the temperature mild in the summer. That name, however, appears to be a misnomer. The average wind speed in Chicago is actually lower than New York City. But the nickname of the Windy City has another apparent meaning. That is, it's a reference to a city that was supposedly full of braggarts and windbag politicians. One popular story is that the name The Windy City was popularized by Charles Dana, editor of the New York Sun. In 1890, New York and Chicago were competing to host the 1893 World's Fair, and Dana wrote scathing editorials about the rival city. It was in one such editorial in 1890 that Dana called Chicago The Windy City, a double play on both Chicago's winds and its political windbags. But while the claim that the term was coined by Dana is relatively well known, there are reasons to question it. First, the supposed 1890 editorial has never been discovered. In fact, etymology historian Barry Popick scanned hundreds of editions of the Sun looking for the editorial and could not find a single reference with Dana using the term. Moreover, the term seems to well predate 1890. In the middle 19th century, several cities were competing over primacy in the Midwest. Popick suggested that the term was actually coined as part of a rivalry between Chicago and Cincinnati. To get an idea of the vehemence of the rivalry, Cincinnati had been the nation's largest slaughterhouse for pigs, and at least since the 1840s, had embraced the nickname Porkopolis. But in 1862, Chicago surpassed Cincinnati in the number of pigs slaughtered, and in the April 10, 1862 editorial, the Chicago Tribune opined that Chicago had taken the title. That's right, Chicago and Cincinnati had a rivalry over who got to be called Porkopolis. The rivalry only increased. In 1869, Cincinnati's baseball team, the Red Stockings, became baseball's first openly all-professional team. In response, in 1870, Chicago created a rival team, the Chicago White Stockings. Public notes several newspaper articles from 1876 on where Cincinnati papers use the term that windy city to refer to Chicago as an apparently derisive term to refer to both the weather and the city's reputation as a braggart. However, with all due respect to Popick's research, the term actually appears to have been common even before Cincinnati's papers started using it in the 1870s. This 1867 issue of the Buffalo Morning Express of Buffalo, New York, uses the term in a headline, suggesting it was already well accepted. In November, the same newspaper used the reference to Chicago to suggest the city was inflating its population estimates. And comically, this Virginia newspaper from 1824 refers to Cincinnati as a windy city clearly in reference to them being braggarts. That means that, like Porkopolis, Chicago may actually have stolen the name The Windy City from Cincinnati. Chicago is often also called the second city. This might refer to the fact that Chicago was the nation's second largest city for many decades, although it was surpassed by Los Angeles in the 1980s. In fact, the term included another rivalry with New York. When Chicago annexed several former townships on its south side in June of 1889, its population approached that of New York. The move might have partly spurred New York into incorporating all five boroughs in a new city charter in 1898, thus maintaining its title. But the nickname Second City also may refer to the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 that destroyed more than three square miles of the city. Residents see the city built after the fire as the Second City. Chicago is also sometimes called the City of the Big Shoulders, taken from a line in a 1914 poem by Pulitzer Prize-winning poet Carl Sandburg. The name was supposed to distinguish working-class Chicago from New York, which was a center of banking and finance, marking Chicago as the shoulders upon which the nation's work was done. It seems that most all cities, even small cities, end up getting nicknames. Albany, the capital of New York, for example, is called Nipper Town because of a 24-foot tall statue of a dog. There are many more nicknames for cities that tell us a lot about history, and some might make it into future episodes of The History Guy. It's interesting that so many nicknames started out as some sort of insult and end up being embraced as a matter of pride. The etymology of the word nickname comes from Old English, echoname, which means literally another name. But that base word, echa, means to increase. Despite their origins, nicknames do not detract. By their nature, they increase. They add meaning, context, history. They are terms of endearment, expressions of pride. They give a sense of belonging.